Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In this presentation, we will discuss the anatomy of the maxillary molars. Our objectives in this presentation will be to discuss the location and position of these teeth, to concern ourselves in relation to the occlusion, to study the morphology and the terminology on these teeth, and to study the identifying characteristics of our maxillary molars. We've got three maxillary molars, which we'll be concerned with, and they're simply called first, second, and third. And these I should say we have three in each quadrant, or three on the right and three on the left. And on the right, there would be tooth number one, two, and three. And on the left, there'd be 14, 15, and 16. Our first maxillary molar is the one that comes in about age six, very frequently confused with uh, the deciduous or baby or primary teeth. The next one, the second maxillary molar, comes in about age 12. Our third maxillary molar, frequently referred to as our wisdom tooth, uh, varies in its eruption, coming in anywhere from 17, 18, up to late 20s. Uh, it's the one that uh, has such a reputation as being a troublemaker. And frequently, uh, I shouldn't say frequently, about 20% of the time it's not found at all, so it seems to be disappearing in its presence. If we look at the cutaway skull on this, we can get a, an idea of the root structure on it. Notice that we are seeing two buccal roots on each of these molars. And we'll also notice that the angulation is a little bit forward. on all of these teeth. They're coming a little bit forward on their angulation. If we should start, taking, start to take more specific notice in relation to the occlusion of these teeth and how they're actually occluding with the mandibular. We made mention that our bicuspids actually are what we call interdigitating. We've got a cusp fossil relationship but we, more specifically, we can term this uh, a cusp embrasure relationship because the cusp of our bicuspids is actually coming up and touching on the marginal ridge areas in our premolar areas here. And we'll define embrasure more specifically for you, but this is an area associated with the marginal ridges. We still have a significant amount of difference in the width of our arches here, our maxillary arch being much wider than our mandibular arch. And the difference in this width is a measured term which is called overjet. Overjet is the distance the maxillary teeth overlap the mandibular teeth in a horizontal direction. It is also called horizontal overlap. And if we can take a look at our gauge here, we can actually put on a gauge and measure this amount by using the back side of our bony gauge and measure the specific amount that we would have an over jet and measure it right down to a tenth of a millimeter or so. We'll notice that with these maxillary molars, as they are interdigitating, we are getting a combination of uh, cusp to embrasure or to our marginal ridge, and we're also getting cusps associated with the central portion of our teeth or the actual fossas. So we get a cusp embrasure and a cusp fossa relationship on these molars, and we'll break this down a little further uh, as we go. If we were to look at the other side here, we'd also notice one other relationship that I think we should take note of. And that is that uh, we have a maxillary sinus to these skulls, and this is present right above 
the apex of our maxillary molars. And if we were to take our skull apart here, we may note that uh, <coughs> these roots have a tendency to be directly in relation to these floor of this maxillary sinus. Infections in our maxillary sinus often can affect these teeth. Actually, the lingual root of this maxillary first molar is penetrating into the floor of this sinus. And sometimes, the roots of second or third molars may also penetrate into the maxillary sinus. This can lead to confusing clinical symptoms. Well, if we go to our individual teeth, we'll start to identify some varying landmarks here. Actually, we're picking up a lot of new terminology with these teeth here now. But the terminology is not really complex because it's associated with the mesial, distal, buccal, and lingual. Those are our four basic surfaces, so we probably should identify those first. If we were to look at the tooth in outline form here, this is the easiest way to really identify the buccal and the lingual because our buccal surface has a height of contour that is closer to the cervical. This height of contour uh, can also be called the uh, buccal cervical ridge or the cervical ridge. It's a bulbous prominence uh, down in here and frequently will be just called the cervical ridge, meaning the height of contour. And then from this area up towards the occlusal, we have a tendency to flatten a bit through the middle third and actually into the occlusal third until we get up to our buccal cusp. Now on our lingual surface, our height of contour is more through the mid portion, and our lingual surface is more evenly convexed. So this is the easiest way to identify our buccal and lingual. In identifying our mesial and distal, I guess the best way would really be to look at your occlusal surface on it, because you have one cusp which is prominently larger than the other, and this is the mesial lingual cusp, and this is always to the mesial surface. Actually, you have four cusps on, four cusps on this tooth, and they're identified strictly by the surfaces. We've got our mesial lingual being the largest in bulk, also being the largest uh, in height, or the furthest from the cervical. We have our mesial buccal, our distal buccal, and our smallest cusp usually, which is the distal lingual cusp. So we're basically talking about a four cusp tooth when we're talking about our maxillary first molar. Our second and thirds have characteristics very similar to these. And as a result, uh, we'll spend much of our terminology identification on this and then just point out the differences in the second and third molars. We have the basically the same line angles at the junctions of the surfaces. We've got basically the same point angles on this. If we look at the buccal surface of this tooth, we can see our mesial and distal outline. Our most important characteristic in this view is the height of contour. Our height of contour is similar to our maxillary premolars. On the mesial, it is usually found in the occlusal one-third. On the distal, the surface is usually rounding more, and the height of contour is usually found in the middle one-third. Our overall width on this tooth is about one millimeter wider from the mesial, no, let's see, one millimeter wider from the buccal lingual dimension than it is from the mesial distal. So the tooth is usually similar to the maxillary premolars, wider buccal lingually than it is from the mesial to the distal. But the tooth overall is about two millimeters wider, both on the buccal lingual dimension, as well as in the mesial distal dimension, than what our premolars were. 
We've got some other rather strong characteristics on this tooth that we should identify for you and start to put some terms in. And again, the terms are very similar to the surfaces and the cusps and what have you. One of the most prominent features on this tooth is our central pit. One of the biggest problems in this tooth because this central pit is usually very deep and oftentimes has a tendency to become carious. Now we have a fossa around this pit area and sometimes these fossas will be called triangular fossas because of the actually apexing into this single pit. And we'll get a groove uh, from the central groove and the other grooves that seem to apex right in this. We generally do away with this triangular terminology and we're just calling it a central fossa or a mesial fossa or a distal fossa or whatever it is and, and leave the triangular out. It doesn't seem to add a great deal to the term other than just carrying some additional uh, jargon with it. We have a mesial pit, which is usually not nearly as distinct or located quite as prominent, but it would be towards the mesial aspect of the tooth. We have a distal pit, which is usually fairly prominent in the distal portion of the tooth. We have a central groove that connects up to the mesial pit, but it doesn't connect to the distal pit very well because we have a rather strong ridge that crosses the tooth. Let me see if I can point out this ridge to you here. This ridge runs from the mesial lingual cusp distally a bit and then crosses the tooth to our distal buccal cusp. And this ridge is termed the oblique ridge. It runs crossways of the tooth, not straight crossways, but uh, it goes to the distal and runs across the tooth. Remember on our mandibular first premolars, we had a transverse ridge that was characteristic of the first mandibular premolar only. This oblique ridge is characteristic of our maxillary molars and very prominently in our maxillary first. It's sometimes also in existence in our seconds and occasionally in our third molars, but very prominent in this first. And this will be a, a very important characteristic, particularly when we get into uh, uh, restorative dentistry and, and, and reconstructing these for crown and bridge and occlusion and, and a variety of other uh, purposes. So that's one area I'll warn you we have to know and know very well is this oblique ridge across through here. There are two very prominent grooves on this tooth, which we should uh, point out and identify for you. One comes out of the central pit and comes to the buckle and is simply called the buckle groove. And it actually crosses the marginal, or I should say, cusp ridge, and it divides the cusp ridge, and we'll go over these cusp ridges here in a minute, and extends down onto the buccal surface, about half the way down onto the buccal surface, but it doesn't cross this cervical ridge or height of contour. Actually, it comes right down the center, almost, of our buccal surface here. The other very prominent and characteristic ridge, or groove, I should say, is this distal buccal, distal lingual groove, excuse me, which comes out of the distal pit and traverses at an oblique angle and comes to the lingual surface. And actually, it does cross the height of contour of the tooth down on the center of the lingual surface. And in the outline form, you can see a little dipping that exists in this height of contour down here. Fact is, it not only crosses the height of contour, but it frequently in the maxillary first will go down and groove right into this root surface. So it's a very strong groove, particularly in the maxillary first molar. We have the same marginal ridge, basically, on our molars. We've got our mesial marginal ridge and our distal marginal ridge. The distal marginal ridge is frequently just a little bit closer to the cervical. We have sometimes a groove that will come up to this mesial marginal ridge and occasionally will cross it just a slight amount. And this again would be a mesial marginal groove. Krauss textbook talks about this groove. I haven't 
found very many teeth in which this shows prominently enough to really point out. It's not a real strong groove. Our real strong one is our central pit and our central groove that comes up to the mesial. Now we can look at these cusps and we find that we have ridges coming from the cusps, not only our triangular ridge that comes down into the central sulcus area, and again, central sulcus would be a valley depression between our cusps. And our central sulcus area pretty much includes our occlusal table. Remember, our occlusal table is the portion in which our food divides and goes to the outside of the tooth or to the inside of the tooth, uh, into the central portion of it. So our triangular ridges will come down into our sulcus, central sulcus area here. Now, with our distal buccal cusp here, our triangular ridge is what almost connects up to our ridge, triangular ridge from this mesial lingual cusp. So we've got several ridges, triangular ridges, coming down into the central area of these teeth. We also have ridges coming from these cusps, which are cusp ridges but you have to be a little bit more specific in the terminology of these cusp ridges. Fact is we have two, for instance, two mesial buccal cusp ridges. We've got a mesial buccal cusp ridge on the mesial buccal cusp, and we've got a, I should say buccal cusp ridges. We've got a cusp, well, mesial buccal, it would be mesial buccal cusp ridge on the mesial cusp, and a mesial buccal cusp ridge on this distal buccal cusp. So we may have to identify this further and say the mesial buccal cusp ridge of the mesial buccal cusp or the mesial buccal cusp ridge of the distal buccal cusp. Let's look at the root structure of these teeth. Actually, as a group, they're probably the most easily identifiable teeth uh, in the mouth in so much as they have three distinct roots. And they're the only teeth, the maxillary molars that have three distinct roots. And the root structure is quite characteristic between first, second, and third molars, but it doesn't outweigh uh, the prominence or characteristics of the occlusal anatomy. The occlusal and crown anatomy is much more reliable than the root anatomy. The root anatomy varies. But on these three roots, we've got specific terms for all three roots, as we did for our multiple rooted premolars, and even our multiple rooted uh, mandibular cuspid. And the molars, or the roots, are termed simply by the location. Now, if we look at the occlusal, to get our orientation measly distally here, I would hope, we would find that one root comes out right under this lingual groove. And this is right in the center of the lingual surface. And this is called a lingual root very same term and same type of location as we had in our uh, maxillary premolars when we had uh, multiple root. It was a lingual root. But on the buccal surface, we usually have two roots. And these are termed by the area that they're located at. We have a mesial buccal root and a distal buccal root. Now where these three roots join, we have an area which we are now calling a tri bifurcation, meaning three roots joining. We called it a bifurcation when we had two. Now we're calling it a trifurcation, or sometimes abbreviated furcation, meaning division of roots. But this is a trifurcation. Now the actual shape of these roots, I think, is important for many reasons, not only from uh, endodontic standpoints, but also from uh, surgical standpoints, periodontal standpoints, many reasons. Our lingual root is usually the longest root on this tooth. It's a single root supporting the lingual half, so it's a little larger and longer than our buccal roots. And it has more of a tendency to be round in its overall structure. It's a large, round-type root. Our mesial buccal root is rather a broad, flat root. This is, more, is similar to our roots on our 
mandibular incisors. It's a kind of a ribbon-shaped, broad, flattened root, and actually occasionally it'll have a concavity down the center of it. it it's so broad and flat on this uh, mesial surface. And very frequently it'll have a concavity on the distal surface of this mesial buccal root, right down on the inside in here. And uh, this becomes rather significant when you're trying to remove this tooth because this really locks into some bone there and becomes quite a problem. Our distal buccal root is the smallest root and it's kind of in between. It's not really round and it's not really flat. It has a tendency to be a little bit on the broad side up towards the occlusal, but it has a tendency to round off as it gets down towards the apex. I really should say cervical. That doesn't really come close to the occlusal. Usually refer to the cervical portion of the root here. Make sure I get my terminology straight here too. We have one section of this root here, and we should have pointed this out on our premolars. Before the roots trifurcate here, or bifurcate, which is called the root trunk. That's actually a new term for you. The root trunk is that portion of the root before we get a division. So we have a root trunk. Actually, if we go back and look at our occlusal outline on this tooth, this is often referred to as being rhomboid in shape. The mesial and distal surface are somewhat parallel, but not necessarily at right angles to the buccal and lingual surface. And we'll make a drawing of this, uh, or if you make a drawing of it, I should say, we can make this rhomboid basically in its shape. That's what they're referring to on. One other prominent characteristic I think we should point out to this, and that is that even though we have four rather distinct line angles, our buccal line angles are more prominent, or I guess you could say sharper, a little bit sharper than our lingual line angles, which have a tendency to round more. But we have one line angle which rounds very sharply as it gets towards the cervical. And this is your distal buccal line angle. Right as it gets to the cervical, it becomes very rounded. In fact, as the whole tooth has a tendency to tuck in in this area. And this, again, becomes quite a problem in uh, restorative and periodontal areas and should be noted. We have this present on the distal cervical area of our uh, mandibular laterals and cuspids, we pointed this out, where this rounding occurs very sharply and prominently on the cervical third of this distal buccal line angle area here. Sometimes this tooth is referred to as having a fifth cusp. When we have a fifth cusp present, it kind of joins in and grows with the largest cusp on this tooth, which we indicated to you as what? Mesial lingual being the largest cusp. Sometimes we'll get an additional cusp which will occur in this area right here, and I have a few of them. Sometimes it's not present at all, as in this tooth, and it can be present in varying degrees here. Again, we find none here. This being our mesial lingual here, we find a small crevice right in here, which indicates a very tiny cusp development. Here, this is getting just a little bit larger. Here, our cusp has gotten so large that we're actually creating a pit in between the mesial lingual cusp and this fifth cusp. And in this one, you can see we've got a very large fifth cusp. And again, a deep pit. I find that this pit frequently has a tendency to become carious and actually requires a separate restoration right in this pit that uh, occurs between the mesial lingual and this fifth cusp. This is usually called just a fifth cusp, or it could be called the cusp of Carabelli. Seems to be a jingling term that has uh, gotten quite a lot of popularity. Cusp of Carabelli, or just plain fifth cusp. Not always present, and it's rather highly variable in its amount and degree and size, but generally always occurring 
when it does appear on this mesial aspect of this mesial lingual cusp. One thing we could point out to you also is our uh, contact areas. Sometimes on these molars, they start to become rather prominent, and oftentimes they will stain quite dark. And this becomes a problem occasionally when you lose the deciduous teeth that are in front of these, and the parents look in the mouth and find a dark contact area, and they rush Johnny in because he's got a, uh, a cavity and uh, you get to checking it and it's, you find that it's hard and stained and it's just simply a uh, contact area that uh, has become stained. Here again we've got a, a contact area on this tooth right in here that has stained up a bit. Notice how this calculus is collecting here. Notice where that is. It has a big tendency to collect there. That's where we get that tremendous rounding of that distal buccal line angle right in the cervical. Very prominent area for calculus to collect because the tooth just takes a sharp dip in in that area. If we go to our second and thirds, we'll do more of a comparison study here and maybe pick up a few additional terms on it. We have differences in size and within the same mouth this becomes most important. This difference in size is about a millimeter in mesial distal width within the same mouth in our second molar. And within the third molar, well, this can vary. Again, about a millimeter smaller than the second yet in the mesial distal width. But this third molar becomes so variable and is so highly irregular and sometimes not even present that we're not going to spend too much time in studying this. We'll give you a little bit of a information identification on it, but we're certainly not going to spend the time on it that uh, uh, it justifies in relation to the amount of variations it has because it's got a thousand and one variations. Our second molars are usually fairly characteristic in their occlusal anatomy or fairly sound in their anatomy. We have about the same width from the mesial to the distal, pardon me, from the buccal to the lingual as we do in our first molar, within the same mouth that is, but we're a little shorter on the mesial distal dimension as I indicated by about a millimeter. We still have the basic rhomboid shape in it, although our line angles, and particularly on the buccal here, are becoming rounded. Remember this was a characteristic between the first and second premolars. As our second premolar started to get quite a little rounding in the line angles. Well, our second molar does the same thing in comparison to the first. It just starts to round out in our general anatomy. And our anatomy occlusally, again, is not quite as sharp and distinct and prominent as was our uh, first molar. And that's the same basic characteristic between the first and second premolars. One of the things that starts to become rather prominent here is this distal lingual cusp. This entire mass starts to become smaller in overall dimension. And this groove that comes out, the distal lingual groove, and as it crosses our cusp bridge here and starts to come onto the lingual surface, it doesn't usually cross this height of contour on the lingual surface. And we don't usually get this deep groove crossing the height of contour. We don't very often have any groove down the root here at all. It just comes down partway on the lingual surface and stops. It's lost its characteristic prominence. Our buccal groove does carry out onto the buccal surface and carries down on the surface a ways, but again, isn't quite as sharp and as deep and as prominent as what it would be on the first. I should make one comment in looking at these buccal surfaces here. Usually our buccal cusps, on both the first and second, are approximately equal in size. Very similar in size being equal. Equal in their width as, as well as their height. And this buccal groove frequently will come right down the middle of the buccal surface. Now on the lingual, we find that this is not 
through our mesial lingual cusp is usually about two-thirds the width of our lingual surface, two-thirds the mass dimension, and our distal buccal cusp is smaller. Come to our second, this occurs even more so. We may have three-quarters of our lingual surface uh, mesial lingual cusp, maybe only one-quarter our distal lingual cusp. And actually, when we go to our thirds, we'll find out that frequently we have our entire uh, lingual surface, maybe just this mesial lingual cusp, and we may not have any or very, very small uh, distal lingual cusp area here. But one thing we also should note, and that is that when this groove does come down on the lingual surface, by the time it crosses the height of contour on the first, it's usually pretty close to the mid portion of the tooth. It comes out at an oblique angle, and by the time it reaches the height of contour, it's, it's almost in the middle of the tooth. In our seconds, this is not reaching the height of contour, and we're not flattening, grooving our lingual root here. The lingual root is usually very round in this area, as is our outline of our tooth, because this groove just isn't crossing. Our anatomy occlusally is basically the same as far as the terminology. We have all four of the same cusp. We have the same surfaces, same line angles, same point angles, same marginal ridges, with again the mesial marginal ridge being uh, closer to the occlusal, further from the cervical, either way you want to put it, and our distal marginal ridge dipping closer to the cervical. One thing that is fairly characteristic about this oblique ridge in this tooth is that it's not nearly as prominent in the second uh, as we find that we're losing a lot of our general overall prominency. Oftentimes this central groove will cross right through this oblique ridge and this becomes important when we're restoring the tooth. We kind of like to know whether we want to follow that groove out or whether we want to stop on this sharp uh, incline of our oblique ridge. And very frequently this will cross right over the ridge into the distal pit, make a groove right through it. Our root structure on our second is usually contained within the crown. And I didn't really point this out too prominently in the first. Let me show you a difference here in existence. But within the first, our root structure is said to be trifurcated very close to the crown, and we have a short root trunk. In the second, our trifurcation is not as close to the crown, and we have a longer root trunk. In the first, this lingual root in particular usually extends well beyond the limits of the crown. It's much broader than what the crown is. In our second, we usually will say that this lingual root is contained beneath the crown. It doesn't extend significantly out beyond the width of the crown. On the buccal surface of the first, we find that the roots are trifurcated close to the cervical and that the roots are well spread. On the second, these roots are not generally spread very wide. Sometimes they will be a little bit, but certainly not as wide as they are in the first. Sometimes they'll actually fuse, and here we can see a, a fusion occurring in them with actually a little bit of bone that was left in that fusion. Uh, this becomes a problem anatomically where our roots separate towards the middle portion of the root, and then they fuse again at the apex. Then when you try to remove these teeth, you've got a little piece of bone that grows right through this area and locks right in on it. But they're not nearly as widely spread. The root structure in general is shorter. But again, our crown structure is shorter. If we compare these with our uh, bicuspids, we'll find that the mandibular, pardon me, the maxillary first molar has a shorter crown. Now, uh, we just got done saying that the mesial distal dimension, buccal lingual dimensions are all greater, but the crown height from the cervical line to the tip of the cusp is about a millimeter shorter than our bicuspids. And when we go to our second molars, again, our crown 
becomes shorter, oh, half a millimeter or so. As we go to our thirds, it becomes even shorter yet. But our root structure does start to vary rather significantly, and this becomes rather important in relation to surgery, in relation to uh, uh, our building restorative restorations on these teeth, because we like a nice, heavy, strong root structure to uh, uh, hold these restorations and bridges and partials and other structures into the mouth. Also becomes very important as far as periodontal uh, problems. If we get uh, infection down in this trifurcation area, this is very difficult to control. We have to go a lot further down the root surfaces to get this in the second premolar and in or second molar, whereas in the first molar, we've got just a very short distance before a root gingival recession and uh, pocket formation, what have you, before we get into this trifurcation. So it frequently will cause us quite a little difficulty. One thing I should point out here, as I see these rings of calculus, this is kind of a ring of hardened calculus on here, and this is a ring of calculus on this tooth here, a little soft tissue, and we showed you some bone and what have you. One of the things that will occur on these teeth are little white lines like this. And this isn't a surface uh, deposit of any nature. And if you were to take your explorers and go over these teeth, you'll find that some of these little uh, areas uh, you can't feel. They just feel completely smooth. But what we have here is what is called a decalcification line. At one time when this child evidently was uh, six, well, probably eight, ten years old, before the second maxillary molar came in, uh, he lost his toothbrush for six months or something, and we got a plaque formation and a generalized beginning decalcification of this tooth right at the gingival line. And this is evidently where the gingival line was at that time. And uh, this has started to uh, decalcify, which is the first beginning stages of our decay. But uh, evidently he found his toothbrush, his gingival tissues receded, and it, and it stopped at that point and never did become a, a problem, uh, not having gone any further. Our outline form, at least from the occlusal, on our third molars is no longer referred to as being rhomboid. Because of a prominent lack of this distal lingual cusp and a very large mesial lingual cusp, we pick up more of a heart-shaped. So you'll frequently refer here the maxillary third molars referred to as heart-shaped teeth. If we look at the inner occlusal on these, and I've got a couple of them set here, we find that uh, they're rather distinctly irregular. We don't find prominent pits, prominent grooves. We get just a lot of accessory fissures, what we call supplementary accessory fissures and grooves that developed in all types of irregular directions. We have some of our characteristics still prominently present, including our three basic cusps on this, on the lingual having mainly our just mesial lingual. We've got very little uh, distal lingual cusp on this. Our marginal ridges are still present, though. So we've got, and our central fossa is still rather prominently present as to whether we have any oblique ridge and mesial and distal uh, ridges. And we certainly have very little, if any, uh, distal lingual groove or no lingual groove down the lingual surface of the tooth at all. If we look to the root structure on these teeth, we'll frequently find that they're oftentimes becoming fused and that uh, they can be separate or they can be fused. If they are fused, we'll find that there's usually grooves in between where the roots should be. This sometimes uh, frustrates students because they have difficulty identifying maxillary and mandibular unless they can count one or, pardon me, two or three roots. And when they're all fused into one, this creates a, a problem. We have basically the same type of a situation with a very broad, flat, mesial surface as we have this broad, flat, mesial uh, root. And on our distal, we have this much shorter, smaller, more rounded uh, distal buccal root, which is usually distinctly different 
and our other roots on it. We're not going to spend a lot of time, as I indicated, studying these third molars because of the large variation that does exist and because really the lack of importance in their mouth and uh, many times they're not present in the mouth at all. But you should be able to uh, identify first and second rather characteristically. And if we haven't got a first or a second, uh, then we can generally toss it into the third category. If we look at the pulp on anatomy on these maxillary molars, you can see that in order to get into the pulp chamber of these molars, we need to place our opening into the central and mesial fossa. Here you can actually see the lingual root canal exiting out of the pulp chamber. This opening is actually mesial to the oblique ridge. Actually, I should mention that this oblique ridge sometimes is referred to as a transverse ridge. Technically, it is an oblique ridge. And on our examinations and the state board examinations, national boards, it will be an oblique ridge. But in common daily terminology, occasionally it will be referred to as a transverse ridge. So if somebody talks about the transverse ridge of a maxillary first molar, you'll know that they're really discussing the oblique ridge. It's kind of an interchangeable term. But you can see the type of opening that is needed in uh, this tooth. You can see some of the pulp canals starting out of the base of the chamber. Let's look at a cross section here. We have a mesial distal section of the tooth, which shows our two pulp horns in this section. Actually, this tooth has four cusps now, so it'll have four pulp horns. We've got our mesial buccal pulp horn and our distal buccal pulp horn. Our pulp chamber, very well defined in these teeth. And then our two canals. We'll have our, oh, let's see, we've got to get our orientation right here on it. I think I call this one the mesial buckle. It'll be over here is our mesial buckle pulp horn. This is our distal buckle pulp horn. Our distal buckle is a little bit smaller. We've indicated that our two buccal cusps are usually of equal size. Uh, actually, the mesial cusp is usually a little bit larger, but not a lot. And certainly, it doesn't have the variation in size that our lingual cusps have on our maxillary first molar. So this is our mesial side. We have our mesial buccal pulp horn, pulp chamber, and our mesial buccal root. Usually, this mesial buccal root will have a little bit of a gentle curvature towards the distal on it, whereas our distal root is frequently straighter. And uh, both these roots are protruding towards the distal a little bit. But these canals are basically rather narrow from the mesial to the distal. If we look at a buccal lingual section on this tooth, we find that we can just see one of our buccal canals. And this is our mesial buccal one here. This is the largest root, the flat one, quite wide from the mesial to the distal. And as we indicated, sometimes this will have a concavity. Occasionally, in a small percentage of these, this will actually be two separate canals. But most of the time, it's just one canal, which is a little bit broader from the buccal to the lingual, since our root is broader. We have to remember our external morphology on it. Our lingual root, which is usually the longest root, although we've got the tip of this one broke off here, is round. And our canal frequently is round in this tooth. And it's usually the largest canal on the uh, tooth. It is also the largest root, usually, on the tooth. Our maxillary second molars are usually very similar. In our mesial distal section, we're sectioning through our two buccal roots again. We've got our two pulp horns, which are prominent, our mesial buccal and distal buccal. And we've got our chamber and our canals, which are, again, very narrow from the mesial to the distal. In this instance, we've got a little piece of bone that actually came out and stayed with this tooth as the apex of our teeth became closer together. It kind of pinched off a little piece of bone right in here. We look to our buccal lingual section on our second. And we should have identified our pulp horns, our mesial buccal pulp horn, since we're going through the mesial buccal root here and mesial buccal cusp. And this will just be our mesial lingual pulp horn. This is the largest cusp on the lingual. So we have a mesial lingual pulp horn we're actually sectioning through here. But again, we've got our round, rather long, fairly good size lingual canal. 
lingual root canal. And then on the mesial, we've got our mesial buccal root canal. And again, there's a possibility that this could be two separate canals on this tooth, although we usually just have one. They usually will constrict just before they come out the apex of the tooth at the apical foramen on these. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.